All right. Good morning, everybody. First, thank you for hanging out and coming to this session. As you can see, it is called a case for building web applications with WordPress. And I'm going to completely dive into this more in just a moment. But first, I always like to start off with an introduction. The least, what are the, 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 least, of re, the, the least of reasons is that why would you want to come to a talk to listen to someone who isn't invested, interested, or has experience with the topic? But I've been building web applications on WordPress for a few years now, and it is something that I see, you know, with WordPress being 15 years old, older than that, um, the next iteration, the next level of development that we're going to be able to see on WordPress, I believe, is going to be building software on top of it. And when I refer to on top of it versus beside it versus uh, other, other ways of centering WordPress as the centerpiece, we're going to dive into that. But before we get started, I want to tell each of you a little bit about myself, both professionally, personally, things like that. So first off, professionally, I am a uh, senior back-end developer for Web Dev Studios. I also moonlight or freelance or whatever you want to call it as uh, uh, for Pressware LLC, which is my own business, where I build custom applications and plugins for small businesses and individuals. For eight years, I ran Pressware, and then this year, I started at Web Dev Studios. So it was, uh, it's been a really, really interesting experience, really great experience. And pr with Pressware, I'm focused primarily on small businesses and in individuals like I like them with Web Dev. I am working at the enterprise level with WordPress. Now, I also blog regularly. Uh, used to it was daily. Then it moved to occasionally during throughout the week. So I try to blog about three times a week. I also uh, this year started doing a little bit of podcasting. It is focused. It's more of an extension of my blog where people can submit questions anonymously or not, and then I will answer them. <clears throat> and then I also fulfill. I also provide some other information um, around uh, the questions. And I try to keep it short, like 20 minutes, because so many podcasts, like right now podcasting I know is all the rage, but, uh, and that's, I think that that's a good thing, but with podcasting, 20 minutes, sometimes you're just gonna be running to the store, you're gonna be out for a walk, you don't need a 60 minute podcast, but maybe 20 minutes. Now, <clears throat> The too long didn't read of how I got, or the TLDR of how I got into WordPress. Back in 2005, I started blogging when I was in school here in Atlanta at Georgia Tech. I was running, I don't even remember which version of WordPress that it was. I know Kubrick was the default theme. I think it was the default theme for several iterations of WordPress. And um, then as I got into uh, the, after college and started working in the software development field, I was blogging about my experiences sharing what I was learning, things like that. And that's something that I still do to this day. But when it comes to WordPress development, I was getting uh, my first time ever actually modifying anything related to WordPress core was messing around with a template file, changing some PHP within one of the files. Fast forward a decade, and the, <laughs> the amount of work I was doing on WordPress was W w had just ballooned. I had gone from .NET and Ruby on Rails, then from Ruby on Rails and to WordPress, and then exclusively into WordPress. And then lastly, I have been speaking at WordCamps and various meetups, um, WordCamps across the country for a few years. I took last year off of all speaking, but yeah, I've, spoke, I've spoken at a number of different WordCamps and uh, different meetups. Now, one thing, if you've happened to hear me speak before, you know that one of the things I like to do during my talks is to make it more conversational. Like I like to have people ask questions in the middle of the presentations and things like that. But this one's gonna be a little bit different. I'd like to get through all of the information uh, and then have time, ample time at the end for questions, comments, etc. So if you have a question, uh, and there is gonna be a good bit of information at the tail end, if you have a question, jot it down and happy to answer it, but I want to make sure I get through everything before stopping and answering questions and things like that. Personally, I'm married to my high school sweetheart. We celebrated our 11 years of marriage last month. We have three kids, two of which are, uh, well, one is seven, one is five, and one is, she'll be born in September. So we're really looking forward to that. 
I have two dogs that we've had since we were married for three months. There are uh, siblings are awesome and then we have two cats which that was not my choice I was outvoted by the women in my house so um, and the dogs they deal with them and uh, you know they're good cats but I'm not I tell people I'm not a cat person I am I am that these cats person but that's it um, as far as interest I am into music in fact for a while I thought I was going to do music as a career then you realize, man, that's, that's a hard career and, and uh, probably not going to make a stable living doing that. And if you want to get married to your high school sweetheart, that's also probably not a field in which you should go in. So anyway, I didn't do music, but I, I still, I have played guitar since I was in seventh grade, dabbled with various instruments, things like that. I also am very much into fitness. Um, and by fitness, I am not someone that you're likely to see at a gym lifting weights or, or anything like that. But I love running high intensity interval workouts, things like that. Parkour, I'm kidding, I don't jump off buildings. Uh, and then like the rest of you, I enjoy reading. I like movies, if I had to pick a genre. Um, horror, science fiction, fantasy, I can't even pick one genre. Um, but there you go, and, and more. I, I, don't know, I don't know what other things constitute interest, but, uh, but that's me in a nutshell. So about this talk. Unlike many of the talks that I've given before, no code is going to be shown during this talk. It's all going to be um, discussed at a high level. And we are going to be talking about software development. So if you have experience with any kind of development, be it software, be it web development, being writing any kind of code that's helpful but not necessary. And then, as I mentioned earlier, please hold the questions and comments till the end unless it's like an absolute emergency. And then I'll answer you. <laughs> okay, so building web applications with WordPress, what does that statement mean? And the idea is that I want us as WordPress developers and those involved in the WordPress economy to start thinking about using WordPress as a foundation for WordPress or for web applications. But I'm very particular about the word foundation. So before I explain why, I want to make sure that I'm clear as to why this is a case. Because sometimes when I talk to people about this, they're like, so you should completely just forget about Laravel or Rails or .NET and just exclusively use WordPress? And that is not what I'm saying at all. I am saying that when it comes to building web applications, don't dismiss what you already have or what you're already familiar with. Because some of the things that can be built with Laravel and with Ruby on Rails and with other Symfony and with other frameworks can be done with WordPress. There are differences and we'll get into that. However, um, I think it's important to, when you sit down for a project or you have an idea, don't just throw everything away. Say, can I do this with WordPress? And that's one of the things I wanna make an argument for today. Secondly, as developers, it's incredibly easy to get distracted with new utilities, frameworks, libraries, technologies, whatever it is that comes out. But one of the things that I've learned in over a decade of doing this is that sometimes the new shiny thing today is gonna be just completely scrapped in six months. And so people like, look at, for example, jQuery. How many of you in here are familiar with jQuery? You don't even have to use, okay, awesome. So I am a fan of a lot of the new uh, constructs that are coming in new versions of the latest version of JavaScript. But that doesn't mean I completely dismiss jQuery. jQuery is a decade old. It has been hammered on. It is used on a wide variety of sites, applications, etc. If there is going to be a bug found in jQuery, it's going to be a pretty weird bug because so many developers have used it that the chance that this bug has not been solved is either you're actually doing something wrong or that the bug is not a bug at all um, it's something that, uh, or yeah, it's something you're doing something wrong, or if it is a bug, then you can report it and it'll be fixed. But the longer software exists, the more hammered people are on it, or the more they hammer on it, uh, then the more tried and true and stable it becomes. And the same thing can be said of WordPress. So with that, why not look at WordPress? And that is the whole idea behind a case for using WordPress for web application development. It's not the case for using it, it's a case for using it. So first, like I said, it is a foundation, it's not a framework. Now, and here's why I, I am very particular about this phrase. Frameworks out of the box don't offer any functionality. You don't sit down and install Laravel on your machine and 
say, okay, I'm ready to go. I, I have a user authentication system set up. I can fire it up in the browser and get ready to run. I don't have session management. And you may have all of the libraries and the functionality that's needed, but you don't have a fully functional application. You have the scaffolding that you need. The same can be said with Ruby on Rails. You have um, all of the, to use uh, yesterday, Carl Alexander had a really good talk about object-oriented programming in um, WordPress, and he talked about how he, he drew an analogy with Legos and the Lego group and Lego blocks and things like that. Well, frameworks provide the blocks, whereas you're the Lego group. And the thing with WordPress is, out of the box, you have a fully-fledged application. You don't have to write any code. You install it, and then you can start using it to write a blog. You can start using it to build a website. You can start using it to do any number of things. But the thing about WordPress is that it offers APIs that allow us to extend the application. And when you think of, well, when I think of extension, I think of like a parent-child relationship where I'm going to extend WordPress down here to do other things. But that's not necessarily the case, and I'm going to be talking about that a little bit more. But this is why WordPress is a foundation. It's a piece of software that already works out of the box. Frameworks don't do that. You have to assemble things in order for it to have functionality. Before we dive in a little bit to that, I want to do an entire history of web development. No, I'm kidding. I want to do an abbreviated history of it. So <clears throat> websites and web apps, what are the difference? Um, if you get on the web and you browse a number of different or you just start browsing around, you're going to end up on landing pages. You're going to end up on what we often call brochure sites. You're going to end up on real estate site. You will end up on something like Facebook or Twitter or social networks and things like that. But there's a difference between, say, a landing page and uh, Twitter. A landing page is a website. Twitter is a web application. And I'm going to talk about the differentiation between the two, but what we've done is we've taken the, the, the colloquial term of website and mixed it with the technical term of web app. So everything is a website. Hey, go to the, go, have you been to this new website, the Facebook? Have you been to, you know, back when it was called, what, 2003? Have you been to, uh, go to, the, go to, go to, uh, go, to the, go to Twitter's website. Well, technically Twitter is a web app, but nobody walks around saying, um, you mean web app? It's not a website. Nobody does that. You just say website, and then you go, and you go to the website. Um, so we've mixed those. But for the purposes of this talk, I want to separate the two. We're gonna, there's, there's websites, and there's web apps. So first, what are sites? A website, in, is, as far as I'm concerned, is the presentation of information. It is described with markup, that being HTML, or it might even just be styled with markup if it's a really boring website. Uh, it may also be styled with custom style sheets or, or CSS. And I don't even want to talk about the direction that CSS has gone with less and SAS and things like that. That's, that's uh, tangential to this, but it's markup. It is it's data described with markup. And it's also, uh, you may see some behavior on the page managed with JavaScript, and I'll give an example of this a little bit later in the talk but it's completely static. So if we were to distill this down into a single statement, a website is the presentation of fixed information. And if you are used to like highly technical terms with respect to software development, all of you in this room are, are smart people, so you could also say it's presentation of static information. Now, this this, this, there's, a, there's a second question involved in this, and that is what is a web application, or what is a web app? This is where you have a, something that runs in your browser. It responds to user input. It, per, it, it processes user input. Perhaps it deals with session information as a person is moving throughout the site and viewing the different screens of your application, or viewing uh, parts of a screen of an application. You have to deal with security. That's something that Facebook doesn't do very well. Um, I don't know why I'm waiting against Facebook, but anyway. Yeah, you have to deal with security. You have to deal with valid data validation. You have to deal with cross-site scripting. There are so many different things that you have to take into account when dealing with data on a website or in a web application that it is so much deeper than the presentation of fixed information. But if that's what a website is, a presentation of fixed information, how can we distill a web application? How about... It's a solution 
that we apply to a problem. It, you know, application der derivative of apply. And that is exactly what or exactly how I want to position a web app in this for the rest of this talk. So how can we easily define the difference? Anything that presents data, and that's all that it does, is a website. Anything that transmits information, saves it, and retrieves it is an application. Yes, you could make a little bit of nuanced arguments in each of these, but that's the general case. Anything that presents data is a site. Anything that transmits information, saves it, and retrieves it is an application. And data encapsulates a lot of information. So let's talk about architecture. How a web application is built on WordPress. So when it comes to building applications, we often, or when it comes to building web applications with frameworks, we think of scaffolding, much like we do with, with buildings. That's you know, where the idea comes from. It's just more conceptual or digital versus analog. But before we talk about software architecture or web application architecture, I want to talk again about sites. And here is how normally the architecture of a site works something like this uh, at a high level or at a basic level. You have a site that's made up of multiple pages. The pages are made up of data. The data is described by markup. And then the pages are linked together through anchors or you know, your A tags in your, in, your, in your markup. That's how a site's put together. Now applications, first part, they're written in more than, than HTML and or CSS and or JavaScript. They deal with, uh, they, some sites can be built with functional programming, there's procedural programming, there's object-oriented object programming. The latter two are the ones that you are most likely to see in WordPress. In fact, I would say that most of, those, most of us who are involved in WordPress are most likely to see a procedural programming in WordPress. I'm a fan of object-oriented programming, and uh, I, I, this is something that I write a lot about. It's not easy in WordPress, but, um, or it's not as easy as it is in other, in other frameworks, but I digress. So the latter two are the most common in WordPress, and just keep that in the back of your mind as we're talking about this. Again, there's no code in this presentation. There's nothing to, to, to jot down, no semicolons or braces or, or parentheses. But furthermore, applications can be divided even, uh, even more. There's the front end, and that is, in general, what the user sees. There's the back end. That's where the data is stored. There is an application layer that sits in between the front end and the back end, and that's where data, when a user sends information to, from the front end to the back end, something in the middle has to handle that information. Now, how it handles it, is not, I'm not going to talk about that right now. But then it also has to retrieve information. Let's say a user requests information um, in a web application. You want to go get on a site and see someone's profile information. You're going to have to, you're, you're going to send a request to the server. Hey, tell me about this person. So it goes out, grabs the information, sends it back to you, and presents it to you. Application layer is responsible for doing that. So the architecture between applications and sites are significantly different. But it always helps, in my opinion, to have practical or tangible examples. And another way of thinking about this, or another way that I was trying to describe this, or come up with a short way to describe it is, you know, it's easy to talk about this, but what if I was to demonstrate it? So one of the things, I, when I was doing some research preparing for this talk, the thing about web applications is that the idea of application sounds really big. And I know that almost sounds counterintuitive because we're so used to apps uh, on our phones these days. Apps are, it's an icon that you press and then stuff comes up. And once the stuff comes up, you're in the app and you kind of stop thinking about all of the things that make it up because you're immersed in what the application is doing, the problem that it's solving, or how it's helping you do whatever it is you need to do. But a application seems to carry the implication that it's a huge piece of software. That's not always the case though. But when I was reading about you know, how people define, describe, and talk about applications on the web, I kept coming across the idea that it was just like this large thing. And that's not always the case. You can have really simple, small applications. So also keep that in mind. You can build very small, very focused web applications. Like I said, it's, it's not always the case. And in over the, next, uh, the remainder of this talk, I'm going to give an example as to how this is true. 
So first, I want to talk about, in the context of WordPress, a simple plugin and how it's not necessarily an application, even though it solves a problem. But then I want to talk about the idea of a larger plugin, and then I want to talk about a distributed plugin. Now, I also have an, a, 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 a bullet point up here of an extension of a plugin. And this is something where if you're familiar with software like Easy Digital Downloads, or are you familiar with that, or Gravity Forms, or any of those types of plugins, you can purchase extensions or add-ons. It's like plugins for plugins, basically. But um, I'm not going to be talking about that, but that is another example of uh, a piece of software. You have software interfacing with another piece of software that's interfacing with WordPress, which in and of itself is software. But plugins. So first, practical examples of plugins. The first one, very simple. And normally I wouldn't do this because it sounds self-promotional, but the the plugin that I'm going to show, it's one of mine, but it's completely free. It, not a lot of people use it, and it's so simple that um, I don't mind sharing it because I have nothing to gain from doing this except for helping to make this point or to help make this case. So I have a small plugin called Easier Excerpts, and the idea behind that, I wrote it back. This was before Gutenberg was out. Um, the plugin is Gutenberg compatible. However, for those of you who write a blog, are you familiar with the excerpt field that's below the editor? Awesome. Okay. So easier excerpts is, depending on your theme or depending on how you have your site set up, when someone is subscribed to your site, they will see the excerpt show up in their RSS feed or in whatever way they consume your information. And the thing about the excerpt field is if you want to have a longer excerpt, and I consider this to be a long excerpt, the excerpt field is great for two lines. But if you want to have like a paragraph or two, it's not so great. So you have to do a lot of scrolling. And when I say a lot, it's obviously related to the size of the excerpt field. So what easier excerpt field is, does is this. It responds to user input. You paste data in, it dynamically changes the text field size or the text area size. You remove text and it knocks the excerpt field back. You don't have to do anything, but the idea is that, hey, I can see my entire excerpt or I see however much is I've put in. That's it. But that's a small plugin. There's no transmission of information. It doesn't save data to the, it, it, it itself does not save data to the WordPress database. It doesn't retrieve information. It just responds to user input. And it does so via JavaScript. So that's a plugin. That's not necessarily an application. But I would like to talk about a larger plugin. Excuse me. Okay. So the four things about what I'm going to break down, so I can't, go because of the nature of the project I can't give specific um, vendor names however that will not stop me from breaking it down and explaining how it's all put together so this plugin <clears throat> first it has to it had to communicate with a third party API it had to then read all of the data that was provided by the API and parse it and by parsing I just mean it would have to read it it had to make sure it was well formatted anything that was not well formatted it would discard that was one of the requirements. I'm, I don't necessarily advocate discarding information that can't be processed. Maybe you should let your API provider know that something's going wrong. Third, it would create custom post types, taxonomies, and templates. And by templates, I legitimately mean WordPress templates. The, it would present the information that it would be pulling from the uh, API. But there was also another component that was uh, batch processing. And I'll, I'll get into that That terminology in just a moment. But this is what a larger plugin can do. And this, in and of itself, it's built on top of WordPress, but it's doing a lot of work that's not related to it. It's communicating with a third-party API. It's reading information. It's parsing information. And then, the, for these la for, for the, especially the third point, it is connected to WordPress, but if you were to pull that part out, you're still doing application-based functionality. So first, this, largest, this larger plugin... <clears throat> The API client had to have an API key, which if you've ever interfaced with another uh, third-party API, um, maybe something like Stripe, you have to have a consumer key and a consumer secret or something like that. You would need to be able to interface or connect to that API, and you would have to do so by having a key or a password or whatever term they provided or they provided to you to connect to the API. Then they give you a list of all the different things that you can do. You can request information from it, et cetera. And uh, or sometimes you can even write information to it. 
In this case, I'm simply pulling information. So then in WordPress, I would have in the plugin a class responsible for going out and then wrapping all of the API methods that you could then invoke within WordPress. Hey, I want to pull this information. I want to pull that information. I want to pull this information. I want to pull that information and then save it to the database. And that's where the reading of the data comes in. Now, this is where I've numbered these and I've tried to do them in the most logical sense possible. Uh, I might hop around a little bit, so this, you know, bear with me if you have questions. I'm happy to answer them at the end. Once you've read a significant amount of data from a third-party data source, you have to do something with it. But you're faced with a problem on your web server. It will time out if you run a process for too long. And you may have run into this with another plugin. You may have run into this in your own code. I don't know. And to make that even more challenging, different servers have different thresholds. Sometimes they time out after 60 seconds. Sometimes it's 120 seconds. Sometimes it's five minutes. It can be really hard. So what you want to do is have a reasonable time. Um, and even if possible, you want to be able to control the full environment in which it's running. That way you know, hey, I have two minutes to run this process. That's where batch processing comes in. So let's imagine you have in, the, in, a, in a database, or maybe um, if, if you don't think in terms of databases, think of like a spreadsheet, and you just have all, this, all these lines, and all these lines of data have to be processed. And in each line, there's more data that has to be inserted, moved around in the WordPress database. Let's say that you have thousands of lines. Well, the thing about that is you can't process all of that information without the server timing out. So you have to batch the work, or in a more uh, less formal, less formal, you have to chunk the work. So you take 10 records at a time, and you say, OK, <clears throat> for the next 120 seconds, I'm going to grab 10 records, process them, send them into the WordPress database, and then move on to the next one. But then you, that raises another question. How do I know, once I'm done with one job to start the next job, or once I'm done with one chunk, how do I start the next chunk? And that is where a job scheduler comes into place. So you have to have another piece of software, another piece of the software that's responsible of knowing where you are in the batch processor, or where you are in the batch processing. So the job says, okay, I'm grabbing 10, and now I am working. Don't bother me. I will notify you when I am done. It processes the information. It completes it, it checks to make sure that everything is done, and then it will send a notification. And that's where I put notification system down here at the bottom because there's, it, it's used in a variety of different ways. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it in a moment. However, whenever you are someone who's administering a site or, or running a piece of software, you've got to know, you have to provide some type of feedback to the user, regardless of if they are a uh, administrator or just a basic, end, a, a basic end user of your software. So when a job is done, you have to notify and say, okay, I'm ready to start with the next job. I'm ready to process the next set of records. Or, hey, I'm completely done processing it. There's nothing to do. Or maybe even you have to go out to the server and say, is there new data that I need to get via the API or not? And then you have to raise a notification about it. Now, how you implement the notification, you know, in WordPress, we think about the, the bars that show up, at the, the admin notices that show up at the top of the dashboard. I'm not saying that's how you have to do it. Um, I'm not even, it, it could be something in a log file. You know, if you're the main person working on this, just pay attention to the logs. Um, maybe you can do enough, uh, maybe you can do a progress bar. You know, if it's not that much information, it's not too hard to take the total number divided by uh, where you are and then show a progress bar. But on top of that, you have to have something that's polling to say, hey, where are we in the process? How many records have we processed? And WordPress has the Heartbeat API, and you can read about it in the codex or in the developer resources, or you can write your own polling mechanism. But it will check to see, hey, where am I? Do I need to send a notification? If yes, do so, otherwise keep going. And then you just repeat this process until the job is done. And then you have this notification system, as I mentioned, and it can, be, it can do a number of things. The notification system is, is here in this context is, is very general. It can say, hey, I'm starting the next job. I'm starting the third out of 150 jobs. Uh, you can say, hey, I'm completely done. You can say, hey, I have uh, a more, there, I've recognized that there's something on the third party API. I've made a request. There's information we don't have. Let's go grab it. Uh, there's information on our server that we have that's out of date. We need to update it. The notification system can be as advanced 
or as simplistic as you need to solve the problem. And then finally, there's the import process. And this is the WordPress specific component that I was talking about earlier. And that's, this is where you have to decide, once I've got the data in the database, how does it need to be presented to the user? Does it need to be a custom post type? Does it need to be a taxonomy? Does it need to be a custom post type stamped or tagged or categorized using a custom taxonomy? Can I use pre-existing taxonomies? There's all of these little nuances that you have to think about. And I'm not here to be prescriptive and say that, oh, you know, every time that you import some new, let's say, paint color from a vendor, that you need to have a custom post type of paint. And then the color is a taxonomy. I'm not here to make a case for which is the best way to categorize your information. But you do need to think about it in terms of how WordPress represents data. Because ultimately, that is where it is going to reside. So that's a, that's a large plugin. I consider that a web application that's built on WordPress. And the reason that it's built on WordPress is because you could remove WordPress from the foundation and replace it with another system of, that provides templating, data storage, and things like that. Now this is something that's becoming more and more interesting in the WordPress economy. How many of you in here have just heard of the REST API? Awesome. Uh, are you familiar with the terminology of headless WordPress? That's another thing that's getting more, okay, cool. So if you're familiar with the REST API, then you have all you need to know about what is from it, what, what, what headless WordPress is all about. So <clears throat> I have this titled an iOS application, and here's why. I am currently in the process of working with two other people. One of them is a uh, cardiologist, one of them is an iOS developer, and then there's me who, who builds software on WordPress. And the cardiologist has an idea for an application that he wants to run on um, iOS. And so there's going to be software, obviously, that has to run on the phone. But then there's going to be something for another party that is, that is going to need to work in a web browser. And I'm going to break down each part of this to you. So first, um, this is by far the most, uh, in my career, the most advanced WordPress application that I have built. And by that, I mean it's, it's advanced in that it's distributed among multiple operating systems, multiple languages, and there's a lot of different little nuances we're having to take into account. It's a lot of fun. It's a little bit challenging. But for um, the sake of this talk, the cardiologist wants to have the patients with the app on their phone. Now, the data that is for the patients is unique to them. They cannot have access to other people's information. If you're familiar with HIPAA, you know that, well, that, by your response, you're very well aware of the regulations around that. Um, but so you have the patients with the data that is going to be on their phone, and then you have thanks to WordPress, the REST API, and then the physicians will have a web application, and physicians have multiple patients but a patient just has himself or herself. Now the REST API is what will allow us to take the patient's iOS application and communicate with the physician's web application. So first, the iOS application, this is gonna sound almost boilerplate because this is how so many applications are built. There has to be user account management. They have to be able to log in. So they're gonna need a username. This can be something like their email address, or it can be something else that they want to choose. And then there's got to be a strong password, because that matters. There needs to be session management, because as they're moving around in the application, we're going to need to know, um, not only are we going to need to know what information they're entering and when, but we're going to need to know uh, if something happens to break, we want to log it so that we can keep tabs on, uh, oh, we need to fix this bug or, or things like that. You don't want to throw up an exception message about something to the user, then, especially for people who are having heart problems. If they see something they don't understand, that might, I don't know what that would do to their heart. <laughs> so anyway, you also want to have data serialization. And by that, on the phone, you want to take the information and save it into a format that you can easily send across the proverbial wire to the web application. And that's what the iOS app has to do. Yes, it's at a high level, but it's relatively boilerplate for a lot of applications, except it's specialized to a specific, very specific industry, but what, what applications aren't. So then you have the WordPress API. 
Now this, even though it's powered by WordPress, is kind of the interstitial part of the application. It allows the user to create the account. And here's one way to think about this. This is why it's not just a matter of, hey, I have an email address and here's my password and I want to set up my account, let me do it. it it's not that easy because you have to then say, okay, a person on their phone is signing up. Then we have to make a hop and say, they, they hit an endpoint. And then that endpoint then has to fire some logic and say, okay, new request coming in, here's an email address. Is this email address of a valid format? If yes, does a user with this email address already exist in the system? From there, and if you're dealing with, with, hip, with uh, security, let alone HIPAA regulations, you gotta wonder, why is somebody trying to sign up with this email address when it's already in the system? Is it just user error, or is someone trying to gain access to their data? So that's another thing. Then, um, you have to send a response back to the iOS application to say, uh, this user account already exists, and you have to handle that appropriately. Or you can create the account and say, hey, congratulations, you're signed. I don't know why I say congratulations. It's not like you've achieved some big task, but that's what all the notifications do, right? It's like, congratulations, you've signed up for your app. Good job, here's your medal. But anyway, you, you create your application, or you create your account, then, you're give, then the, app, the iOS app will read the status code and says, okay, you're ready to go. So then you sign in with your email address and the password. And if you don't want to send passwords via email, and I don't think you should send passwords via email, instead you can do, uh, one of the popular things right now are magic links. Slack does this a good bit. Um, you can also give the user the ability to go on to, um, they can hop somewhere in the page and set up their own password, confirm that it's strong, all of that. And, but the API can still, the API that you design can still give you the information necessary to say, hey, this is successful or it's not, and then respond appropriately. But then you get into the area of saving data and retrieving data. So let's say that you are using this app as a patient and you want to save your information to the uh, physician's application. The physician's application is the one that resides in WordPress. So first, you wanna serialize information that is uh, safe to have on your phone should, you know, God forbid your phone ever get lost. You want to save it into a format like JSON that's easy to send across the wire to the server. But the longer the user uses the app, either the greater the data is going to be, or the size of the data is going to be, or you're going to have to think of a creative way to say, okay, the last time we saved the data was this date and time, so we're just going to send the most recent. And then it also needs to be able to retrieve data. If you want a historical account of all the information that you've ever entered into an application, you've got to be able to retrieve that from the web application. And once again, we're back to notification systems. And the reason I mention this is because giving users feedback is so important. And you don't want to do it in developer jargon. Um, you don't want to throw up the result of an exception message. You want to give something that lets them know, hey, something happened, or yes, this was successful, or the data's been saved, or um, another, another move that we're often seeing now is that when data is saved, it's just saved silently in the background. There's not even a save button. And I think that's elegant, but I think it also can confuse some people if you've used uh, like Microsoft Word for 20 years, you're used to command save, command save, command save, command save, and all of a sudden now the app is saving your work for you automatically. How do I know it? How do I trust that? When is the last time that it saved it? You know, there's a lot of little things around that to consider. But then you have the physician's web application. Now remember, we talked about a patient has one physician, but a physician has many patients. So the physician's web application is actually going to be a, uh, it's gonna be built on WordPress and it's gonna be designed to run in a web browser either on an iPad or on a computer. And from there they can see all of their patient information. They can see all of their patients and then for each patient they can drill down and see uh, charts, records, et cetera. And there, <laughs> there's, there's notifications built into this part too. Because if you're a cardiologist and one of your patients saves information and they have a arbitrary threshold of where a number should be or shouldn't be, then the physician needs to be notified, hey, patient, uh, patient zero, for those of you who are fans of uh, zombie comics or zombie movies, patient zero is always the one who's the one that causes the outbreak. But anyway, um, whenever patient zero's value goes higher than what it should be or lower than what it should be, you need to notify the physician. 
But then you got to decide, hey, does it notify them just during working hours? Does it need to be on call? Do you need to have a text messaging system built in, et cetera? But let's just say it's in WordPress. And so they're in WordPress. They're reading through reports. Let's say that you opt to use the Heartbeat API. So every 15 seconds, it's polling. And it says, oh, patient zero, There's a, the threshold has just been, uh, the, they've just saved their data. The threshold, they're above threshold. And then they need to take whatever action is necessary. And then finally, you want to generate reports. Now, a reporting, it can be charts. It can be just an Excel spreadsheet. It can be a CSV. It really depends on how they want to see the data represented. Now, the purpose, again, of this talk was to be, was to, was to, was to kind of sit at a high level. It wasn't to, this is why there was no code. It's to be at a high level to say, here are a few different ways that you can build software on WordPress. And the reason that I wanted to make sure that it was presented in this way is because it's just a case for why WordPress is an option. Not it's that it's the option. And so in the talk, and this is, I, I want to um, touch on these points because I know that we're holding questions to the end is we went through the pro, we went through web development, uh, well an abbreviated history of web development. We talked about the difference in sites and applications, even though we've kind of mixed those terms together. Um, we've talked about simple plugins. We've talked about small plugins. We've talked about add-ons or extensions of plugins. We've talked about large plugins, and we've talked about full-scale applications that are distributed between iOS devices, the WordPress REST API and WordPress, and then how this encapsulates an entire web application. But remember, like I was saying, this is still a case for building web applications on WordPress. It's not a framework. WordPress is not a framework. You'll see it oftentimes mentioned online. WordPress is a great framework for building web applications. WordPress is a great framework for this. That or the, I, it's not a framework. It's a foundation. If it was a framework, it, was not, it, will, it, would, not offer, it would not be a fully fledged application out of the box, and it is. Um, there are, but the nice thing about WordPress is there are existing powerful APIs that we can already use to take advantage of some of the functionality that WordPress offers. User authentication, session management, um, and couple it with some of the newest features in PHP. You can write things in an object-oriented manner. You can do a lot of filtering, validation, retrieval of information, things like that. You can connect to a variety of different data sources. That's nice. But then you can also take, for those of you who work in other fields, I was talking with a gentleman yesterday who is a uh, .NET software engineer. If you are familiar with building software in another way, be it .NET, be it Rails, be it PHP, be it any other of the variety of languages that are out there for building software, you can still apply those same techniques to WordPress. If you are going to be responsible for building a, for building a object relational map, you can do that using WordPress as long as you understand the database schema or create your own tables and insert that into the WordPress database. You can do all of that. You just have to do it within the context of WordPress. And, when I, and, I, and I say that phrase a lot, the context of WordPress, and I say that to drive home the fact that all of this does, it, WordPress is the foundation, but it's extremely ex extensible. And so ultimately, whenever you have an idea for building a web application, and you think, oh man, I would love to build this, but I can't do this on WordPress. I gotta go learn another framework and I gotta go attend these workshops and I've gotta go read these books and now I don't wanna do anything. I don't wanna build anything because now I gotta go do more work before I even get to work. But pump the brakes on that thought and ask yourself, why not WordPress? What is it that it doesn't have that I, what does it not have that would allow me to build this? So with that, thank you so much for coming. I know it's 9 o'clock on the day of the after party. <laughs> so if you're, you know, <laughs> hungover or if you are drinking some kind of uh, special coffee or I don't know what's in your white cups, thank you so much for coming. I really do appreciate it. I hope that this talk helped to expand the ideas or that expands your proverbial horizon as to what you can do with WordPress. But at this point, I am completely open to questions, comments, and conversations around this. It's something that I really enjoy. And so with them, I open the floor for, for questions. Yeah. My question is, um, and this is exactly what I'm looking for, mm -hmm. um, but where do, you, where do you go to learn how to do this? I mean, I'm, it's not, you know, just out there, this is what you do. Right. I've been doing a lot of Udemy courses, trying okay. to 
learn some new stuff. I'm, mm -hmm. a database, I'm a database developer. Okay. Have been for almost 30 years. Okay. And now I'm trying to figure something else out after getting laid off, and you can't just be a database person anymore. You have to do more. So right. I'm trying to figure that out. Okay. And I shied away from WordPress for so long because it was just kind of locked down. You couldn't do a lot of stuff. You can't have your own data. And this is you can. Mm -hmm. So I need to... I need how to do, okay, so the question is, how do you learn to do this in WordPress if you've not done it before? Or if you have experience in other fields, industries, or segments of the industry, how do you learn to begin bringing this into WordPress? Is that a fair summary? Okay, so <clears throat> the first thing I would recommend, um, Carl, I'm going to ask you to, this is not a plant. <laughs> can, you please can you please plug your book oh, with the sure. discount code? Okay. I'm doing all that. Okay. Too. Okay. I was trying to find okay to create an application that in. can interface with, but it sounds like I can do this. Yes. And that's kind of what I'm. Trying okay. To out. In addition to that, so his site's at carlalexander.ca. Yeah. Um, I, no, I want to like. Okay. This is okay. your talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like to outsource as much information to you. <laughs> We're going to have questions, and y'all are going to answer them. No, but um, it's a really good resource, like, and so that's why I wanted to mention that. The second thing is there, um, and, and this is, uh, I guess, unapologetically self-promotional. I, I blog about object-oriented programming in WordPress. Did you say you know I do? I, I follow you. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. So um, I write about things in very small segments, but if you, here's the best advice I can give. I think, you know, you to me and online courses and things like that, you're going to find it's going to be a mixed bag. I'll be honest with you. You're going to find, like, that wasn't so helpful. But, or, or you're going to say, like, wow, that was really good. To, oh, that's awesome. That's exactly what exactly. you And you can't, and uh, for being somewhat, I'm older, and I'm just, all this technology is, is a little, it can be a little. I'm trying to figure out which way to go. Mm -hmm. And I've got all these options. Which one do I choose? Mm -hmm. So I was like, this is what I want to do, but where do I go now? And I'm not, I'm a self learner, mm -hmm. but I have to be pointed in the right direction. Okay, so are you familiar with, um, being a self-learner is such, is such a great skill to have. Are you familiar with Zach Gordon? I, have, I am, because I know the name. Okay, he's on Twitter, at Z Gordon. He has courses on a variety of different things. And I wish I could give you, like, one place to go to learn how to do this. But what I would recommend is spend time in the WordPress in the WordPress codex and understanding the or, or learning the WordPress APIs, there's a and, and just you know look it up on DuckDuckGo or Google and say you know WordPress codex or WordPress APIs in codex, and then match that with PHP. That's going to give you a lot of and the because then you know then you have mark you have your HTML5 you have your CSS and things like that but that can also be built by a front end designer. But if you're if you've been working with databases then I would venture to say that you're very server-minded, back-end-minded, things like that. And so when you start thinking about building applications, you can probably, I would, and I'm making a leap here, but you would be able to say, you would be able to put something together and then display it on the screen. It may not look pretty, but you can always bring someone in to help it look pretty. Yeah, the functionality of it is exactly what I'm really good at. Then I would say um, in the, in the WordPress developer resources, look up the available APIs and see what it does offer. Um, it's okay to ask questions on Stack Exchange, the WordPress.StackExchange.com, but be careful. Like, use, don't just assume every answer you get is is the best answer. But that's with any site, right? Go ahead. No, go for it, David. It's a long it's drive. It's really, it's really hard. Yeah. It's very inconvenient. 
that's an all day. <laughs> and that's right. It's, it's, you have to like be in that area when it starts. Right. You know, starts at you, noon. <laughs> yeah. To get there. If, if you have trouble getting to his local meetup, there are various online resources that you can probably substitute for that. And I'm probably able to find some links later. Okay. Um, like the Slack channels and stuff like that. Just like if you want to be pointed in the right direction, you need to be in a group, in a room of people that says, I want to learn about how WordPress reads third party APIs and send it to somebody who will give you like eight or ten links. And then that is a perfect opportunity to take it and run with it. So usually WordPress meetups are great for that. So there's Slack channels and mm -hmm. various other things that I'll see if I can pull up something there. And the last thing I want to mention before um, doing other questions is go to wpsessions.com. Uh, you're going to find a variety of different topics there, but some. I'm sorry. Word sesh. Yeah, but WP sessions. First, first WP sessions is a just a library of people who work exclusively with WordPress. They've built sites for the Wire Cutter, which is owned by the New York Times. They've built or web apps that do that, and then down into other um, smaller niches. But then later this month, um, Word sesh, which is. Um, Word Sesh, which is uh, an online conference, power or uh, I don't want to say powered by the same person. It sounds like he's on a hamster wheel. Um, he's the same guy who runs WP Sessions, Brian Richards. He's going to be doing it. It's an online conference. So I hope I hope that helps. And don't he hesitate to email me. I'm always happy to answer further questions about that too. Yes. So uh, I, I have a couple of uh, web applications already on uh, WordPress. And one of the things that I, I'm always trying to figure out is there, there's so much customization that you have to do sometimes to get the results that you want. Mm -hmm. And every new update on WordPress or <laughs> you may be something that will break your application that is working amazing. Is there a point that you have to just unplug the core WordPress from the update and say, hey, that's an application, it's not a WordPress mm -hmm. thing anymore. And I don't, I have, I don't need to worry with what's going on on the WordPress arena at this point. Mm -hmm. Just run with the application. Okay. So the question is, if I'm building a web application on WordPress, uh, is it possible to turn off or to say, hey, I, I want to do essentially a feature freeze. I don't want to upgrade WordPress because where it is right now is acceptable for this application. Is that yeah. correct? Okay. So first, I would the, the first thing I want to... I want to make clear is when you turn off the ability to upgrade, you do run the risk of disabling security updates. But if you have control over the environment in which it's in, like if it's on an intranet or something like that, then um, that responsibility is on you to handle that. But you can turn off update notifications. You can turn off auto updates. You can turn off a, anything that deals with automatically upgrading WordPress. You can disable that. Off the top of my head, I can't remember all the, all of the things, the proverbial knobs you have to twist to do that. But if you will look up, it's in, it's all documented in the developer resources in the codex of disabling auto updates. But it's something that you recommend on those scenarios, or you mm. think that it's better to keep changing. Uh, it depends because with an upgrade. So the question was, do I recommend doing that? And the, and um, the, I'll have to, this will be my last answer so, so I don't run into the next session. But um, this is one of those answers I hate to give, but it depends. And it depends because you do run the risk of losing security updates. However, um, if you also miss out on updates, you could gain access to new APIs, but you may also lose APIs that you're already using. And in that, in that scenario, you're either tasked with, okay, I'm going to run the risk of just leaving things as they are, or I'm going to write, um, in object-oriented programming, there's a design pattern called the adapter pattern, and the adapter will take an old API, and you basically build, um, just like when you connect, a uh, let's, let's say, an American power, uh, power cable to something in Europe, it's an adapter that sits in between it and then processes the information. So it says, okay, the information's coming in an old way. I'm going to reformat it and then save it in a different way. So I hope that helps. That's, it's a really good question, but it's not an easy answer. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone, for, for coming.